We're going to do nothing but try and clear up another backlog of viewer questions and comments in this week's show. This is Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we set up our studios in the Big Valley Creation Science Museum so we could continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. Yes, we believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain for a reason. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com, that's the show, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. We have a huge backlog of viewer questions and comments, so let's get right into the mailbag. Mail for me? Hmm. 20-inch soul wrote in on YouTube. I'm interested in factual scientific evidence, says the religious fanatic and young earth creationist. That's pure gold, lol. Grind in your core wrote, I thank God every Saturday morning for you, Ian Juby. The ammo and tools you give us believers are powerful in helping others realize the truth of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Ian, for your hard work. And thanks for the kind words and taking the time to write in. Messianic Nazarene wrote in on YouTube in response to my analogies of Christ, the Ark of Noah, and baptism. Hi there, Ian. I love watching your videos and learning from you. However, there is one issue I take with this one. Baptism, as we know it, was not new with John. It was based on the mikveh, tevila, ritual bath by immersion, from the Tanakh, sometimes referred to as the Old Testament. It is still used by the Jewish people. In addition to covering, washing your sins, it was, is, used to place yourself under the authority of a particular sect and or rabbi. Well, thanks for writing in. Rainer Warrior 666 wrote in on YouTube, Radioactive dating has absolutely nothing to do with evolutionary timelines. Nice straw man, though. I agree. Radioactive dating is subservient to the evolutionary timescale. If the radio, radio dates disagree with the evolutionary timeline, the doctrine of evolutionary timeline is always deemed right and radio dating wrong. Therefore, radio dating is obviously irrelevant. Keys to Freeze wrote, also wrote in regarding radio dating. Quote, the radioactivity in the past was incredibly fast, end quote. I will give a more proper response later, but I can say for now, your choice of words is glaring, Mr. Ian. I take the science seriously, Juby. Can you honestly say you understand half of what you're saying? Oh, I most certainly do understand what I'm saying. As well as the eight PhD research scientists who conducted the eight-year serious scientific study, now, when you are ready to provide a serious response to the serious scientific study, I look forward to hearing it. But it's pretty obvious by your comment that you haven't read the very serious two-volume report, which you can now even download for free. Ryan Sinat and Magnus from Norway both wrote in similar questions. Hey Ian, it appears that animal life is dependent on the circle of life to keep the system balanced and in order like population. If animals were not designed to die or eat each other, then why do animals like snakes and spiders have poisonous venom? I feel that eternal life was only intended for man and not animals. Hope to hear your response. Great work, by the way. Hi, Ian. Love your show. I have a question. If there was no death before the fall and all creatures were vegetarian, do we find evidence of such claim that all meat-eating creatures have been vegetarian at some time in history? 
And why is the scorpion's tail designed to sting its target when there was no death? Do you think microevolution could create such a dangerous weapon? I know that snake venom could possibly evolve by modifications of existing salivary proteins, enzymes that became deadly, but this method does not, still not explain why the scorpion has a physical stinger. Really hope you could shed some light into this, because this is something I have wondered about for a long time. Well, thanks for writing in, guys. Now, evidence for meat eaters eating plants would be difficult, because virtually all meat eaters actually do eat plants. But the answer to all your questions still boils down to some unknowns. We are in a fallen world, so how can we judge the past by the present? Well, we cannot. Experiments conducted at the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas, attempted to simulate what Dr. Bach contended was the conditions of the world before the flood of Noah. Now, this simple chamber had increased oxygen and carbon dioxide levels, increased atmospheric pressure, 24-hour-a-day pink light, and a stronger electromagnetic field simulating the Earth's stronger magnetic field in the past. Remarkable things happened in these conditions. They doubled the lifespan of fruit flies. Venomous copperhead snakes showed a radical change in their venom within days. Some proteins were expressed more, some less, others removed from the venom completely, while still yet other proteins were produced which weren't produced before. Now it's entirely possible this new venom was non-toxic. Simpler experiments in hyperbarics at Texas A&M in the 1980s had a biosphere with trout and birds. Now they discovered that this very aggressive carnivorous fish could get their complete nutritional needs met just by eating the bird droppings from the birds in the biosphere. So we see radical changes that take place in organisms under these conditions. More research needs to be done, but as you can see, just a few quick observations shed a whole lot of light on the subject. Now, as Penny Sutterfield pointed out, spider webs can capture seeds being blown by the wind. Now, again, as we see from the fossil record, there's been a radical loss and deterioration of vegetation on Earth. So while it is speculation, it is possible that spiders simply made webs to capture high protein seeds being blown by the wind. Now with regards to venomous snakes, why were they designed with fangs and a system to inject this venom? Well, as John Mackay points out, there are two ways to digest food. From the outside in, like we do, or from the inside out. Now, if, say, the snake was originally designed to eat fruit, I, I don't know what it would have eaten in the pre-flood world, then the snake could bite the fruit, injecting digestive juices into the fruit, then swallow the fruit whole, digesting the fruit from the inside out. With regards to the tail of the scorpion, I haven't got a clue why it has a tail like that. More research needs to be done, like that conducted in the biosphere. What changes in habit and biology would take place in the scorpion under those conditions? I don't know. That's where research is important. And I would encourage people to support the Hyperbaric Biosphere Project at the Creation Evidence Museum, where they are constructing a huge biosphere for research to hopefully help answer some of these fascinating questions. The results in the smaller unit were absolutely stunning. Stick around, we gotta take a short break. Be back in just one minute. Oh, not again. To the horror of both fans and enemies, Ian Juby is back with more ranting goodness. Okay, Jacques. You first. Just when you thought his meds had kicked in, Ian goes off on a tangent about what killed the dinosaurs. The origin of life, defining evolution, and yes, even sex. It wasn't enough for an R rating, but nowadays, what is? Volume 4 of his ever popular and ever hated Karevo Rants has eight new short, fast, funny, and hard-hitting episodes. 
You can get your copy on the soon-to-be-extinct DVD for 15 bucks plus shipping and handling, or purchase the instant digital download of all eight tracks for just eight bucks. Or you can buy all four volumes of his world-infamous rants for the price of three. Order your copies today and have a party with, like, popcorn and stuff. Visit Ian's Bookstore today. for me? Numerous people wrote in response to our 10 questions for creationists episode, which ended with eight questions for evolutionists. Now, several people criticized me for quoting a web page written in 1996 as the source of the questions. Now, as I explained both in the program and in my responses, I used that page because some atheists were handing it around to people asking for a response. Secondly, as I already mentioned, I too was completely unimpressed by the list of questions. I even went searching for a better list of questions, which I felt were of higher caliber. I found none. In response to my response, several people then criticized me for using a badly written web page from 1996 as the source of my questions, as clearly these were lousy questions. Look, I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. If they are such lousy questions, and I agree, then why are the atheists still passing around this webpage to creationists, asking them to respond? Ugh. Several YouTubers then wrote in remarking on the phenomena, like Berlin Friswell. Did you know they're still asking the same questions? Ironically, not two days after that episode aired, two excellent web pages were written by evolutionists attempting to answer some of the questions of creationists and posing some questions for creationists. Now, I hope to get to those soon because these compositions were of much higher caliber. YouTuber MoveOrder did at least bravely write in some responses to the eight questions for evolutionists with which I closed out the show. Don't accuse others of making assumptions in their questions when you do the same in yours. The copious numbers which point to a young Earth. I don't believe for one second that you actually are interested in these questions. The age of the Earth is proven. Biological evolution is a fact. And Noah's flood never happened. If you really would like to know how the scientists know this, you would ask them, not the fellow Yate layman on YouTube. Well, thanks for writing in. Let's briefly examine his responses. In response to my first question, Let's start at the beginning. How did the first life arise? If you have no life, then you have no evolution. Following the laws of science and nature, how did that first life arise? Move Order responded. I don't know, but the scientists have a pretty good idea. What scientists know this? You need to understand what your response equates to is, I don't know how that miracle happened, but the scientists have a pretty good idea. That first life must violate well-established scientific and natural laws. That means the event was extra-natural. Supernatural. It's the same word. It's a miracle. In response to question number two, Move Order claimed that Grand Canyon was carved by the Colorado River. Well, even in the paper I cited in the show, the authors acknowledged the problems and controversies surrounding that theory. Namely, it doesn't work. As I pointed out, even the evolutionary geologists agree that the Colorado uplift happened before Grand Canyon was carved through it. Therefore, you'd have to miraculously get the Colorado to flow uphill for thousands of feet before it started cutting Grand Canyon, when the river could have gone and flowed around the Colorado uplift. In response to question number three, Move Order responded, I haven't heard of any, but I have heard of hundreds of dating methods that proves the Earth is much older than 6,000 years. Hundreds of dating methods? Or hundreds of assertions of deep time and great age? There is a difference, and too often those lines are blurred. I do not know of hundreds of dating methods. There are dozens, no doubt, and those dozens of dating methods, ironically, conflict with each other, usually by many magnitudes. But, in fairness, Move Order says he is unaware of dating methods that point to a young Earth. There are at the very least dozens of dating methods that also point to a universe and Earth far, far younger than the billions of years claimed. 
Dr. Russell Humphreys compiled a very quick list of 14 examples here, such as the sea salt problem, Earth's decaying magnetic field, and biological decay. Now, that's 14 right off the bat, but there are many, many more, especially when you include the biological sciences. When you use the same rules to the different dating methods, and one of those dating methods that comes up with a vastly younger age, then in all likelihood, the younger age is the correct one. For question number four, I asked, what scientifically factual information can you supply to support your contention that the universe is billions of years old? Don't give me your assumptions and theories and don't give me the speed of light problem because it's also a problem for you. And I already answered it with my response. I want scientifically factual information. Move Order responded with, the huge distance to the stars in a stretching universe, for one. Well, in your response, you can only be referring to the starlight problem, which I specifically mentioned in my question for you not to use. I even gave the reason for it, such as that distance is also a problem for those who believe in deep time. The energy is very evenly distributed throughout the universe. But that energy can only travel at a maximum speed of the speed of light and would take far more than the alleged age of the universe at 13.8 billion years to get evenly distributed from one end of the universe to the other. So you did not answer the question at all. When I asked, how do you explain the origin of information, such as the information contained in the DNA, without violating the law of thermodynamics, Move Order bravely answered that he did not know. Now, I respect that. This is not to mock move order in any way, but to bring the point home. Saying that the information evolved is like saying that a book evolved without an author. If you find a book, you know that it had an author. I must ask the very pointed question. What would you say to someone who said a book wrote itself? The book clearly points to an author. Why on earth would someone deny the existence of the author? For question number six, I posed, how do you explain the preservation of the information in our DNA over millions and millions of years, seeing as how thermodynamics is observably and quickly removing bits and pieces of that information in every single generation? My question was apparently poorly worded, as Move Order says he did not understand the question. I was specifically referring to what is commonly called genetic entropy. This deterioration is happening on a couple of different levels. One of those levels is documented in Dr. Jonathan Sanford's book, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome, and given in a layman's version in my Crevo rant number 78, The Boat That Don't Float. Now the second le level of decay was documented in Dr. Andrew McIntosh's excellent paper, Information and Entropy top-down or bottom-up development in living systems. Basically, every generation passes on its genetic information to the next generation, but adds some errors into the information. So we are losing genetic information every single generation, and it's fast, really fast. It demonstrates we cannot have been around for millions of years, because otherwise, we would have lost so much of the genetic information, we would be extinct. Furthermore, this is the exact opposite of evolution, which requires that miraculous gain of information I asked about in question number five. I asked about the origin of sex in evolutionary terms. Move order replied with, The first eukaryotes to engage in sex were single-celled protists that appeared approximately two billion years ago over 1.3 billion years before development of the first animals with neurons capable of assessing pleasure. I don't understand why the how part is so important to you and I don't have the answer. Now please note I did specifically ask for observations, like any good scientist would want. What Move Order provided was a generic evolutionary assertion based upon zero evidence and a whole mess of speculation and assertion. The how part of the origin of sex is crucial. Is not evolution supposed to explain the origin of the species? The origin of sex is crucial to the origin of those species. If the sexual reproduction system fails, it is the extinction of the species. 
And as we've seen with the mass problem of infertility, even minor changes lead to a failure of the reproduction system, not an improvement. My claim that God created the male and female is just as valid an assertion as yours. At least I have the observational observations that changes to the reproduction system leads to extinction, not evolution. I asked the provocative question, do you think your brain was intelligently designed? And if not, then how can you trust your thoughts if they are the result of unintelligent, undirected forces? Random chemistry. To which Move Order responded, I think my and any other brain is awesome, but it was not designed. It grew in my mother's womb. I trust my thoughts because it works. How do you think I could have survived for 40 years so far if I couldn't trust my thinking? Unfortunately, you missed my point. The fact that you have thinking demonstrates the intelligent design of your brain. How can a non-thinking universe produce thought? It cannot. Let's simplify it for the sake of our brains which are stuck in this natural world and hearken back to being creators ourselves. We can make artificial brains, computers. We can cause that computer to have thought more or less. Though the artificial intelligence we can produce is very artificial and not very intelligent. Can an unthinking universe produce a thinking computer? Well, of course not. If you found a thinking computer complete with programs running, there would be only one logical conclusion. The computer and its thoughts and program was intelligently designed. Thought only comes from forethought. Thought does not come from thoughtlessness like our universe. Your brain and its thinking is proof positive that it was intelligently designed. If your brain was the result of randomness, then you could not trust your thoughts, including the thoughts that say your brain was the result of non-intelligent forces. You actually would not have thoughts and conclusions <laughs> because you wouldn't have a brain to begin with, and even if you did, your thoughts would be the results of random electrical firings and not logic. You venture into illogical conclusions. The reasons for this have to do with your free will. You choose to venture into illogic because you do not like the logical alternative that your brain was intelligently designed. But that intelligent designer must let you venture into illogic and believe whatever you want, else you have not actually been given free will. I pray that you will embrace logic and the creator of your logic and brain. In response to discussion on our YouTube channel, Thompson D10 replied to a comment by Dom Luna about the complexity of life. If God had created us to be as simple as you suggest that he should have, then you would be arguing the opposite. I would imagine something like, a God, who needs a God? Look how simple everything is made. Even I could do it, there is no God. One is not required to make all of this. Instead, we are looking at a creation where parts of it are so complex, our current best minds have no idea how to even explain it, let alone try to recreate it. If I were given a lifetime, I could not make even a single dandelion. Glory to God and his infinite complexity. Many of our faithful viewers will remember Dom Luna's comments that prompted my response with the analogy of robots, where we can play the role of a creator in order to understand our creator. After a brief and pleasant exchange, Dom Luna wrote in, Hi Ian, I hope you are well. I still don't see how a mass killing, what humans call genocide, is the most moral solution to human disobedience. It seems like an omnipotent and omnibenevolent God could come up with a much better way to gain compliance than the method used by the most evil dictators. What about the children and babies? What did they do that was so wrong? Why did they have to die? I guess I have a problem with a blanket statement of evil being used to describe everyone on earth. I know you came to creationism at a dark time in your life and you credit it with saving your life but there are alternatives to creation if it ever fails to succur. Well, thanks for writing in. I too hope this finds you well. This is a common question which I will be dealing with in an upcoming special Genesis Week episode, answering common atheist arguments. And it's an excellent question. 
how could a loving, caring God kill everyone in the flood, including innocent children? Well, let's bear something in mind here. For 120 years, Noah built the ark and warned everyone of the judgment to come. All they had to do to escape was heed God's warning. Through Noah, take the free salvation from the judgment to come, just get on the ark. So whose fault is it those people died? Whose fault is it those children died? Was God merciful? Was he just? Was he patient and giving? Yes, to all of the above. And so, Jesus warned us of the great white throne judgment to come. Will you embrace the mercy of a God who wants to show you mercy? Or will you reject that mercy and force his hand in judgment against you? We have all sinned against God, our Creator, and this world has been corrupted by it. This world will be destroyed and a new one made. But if sin corrupted this world, then obviously he cannot allow even one drop of sin into the new heaven and new earth. So what will become of you when that day finally rolls around? Like Noah, warning everyone at God's command, God patiently waited for a very long time to give people a chance. But he must eventually close that door and bring destruction to this earth. What side of that door will you be on? He desires to give you mercy so much that he gave his own son as a sacrifice to die in your place, to take the punishment for your sins. And while salvation cannot be purchased, it does come with a price. He gave his life for you. You must give your life to him. Live your life in place of Jesus Christ here on earth's earth. What is holding you back? I wonder what it was that held back the people who died in the flood. What held them back from embracing the free salvation? All you have to do to be saved from the judgment to come is to believe that Jesus died for you. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and ask him to save you. Give him your life as a sacrifice like he did for you. He promises you eternal life and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, that's it for this week's show. I'm your host, Ian Juby. I hope you'll join me again next Genesis week. Remember, you can send in your comments, questions, heat mail, and your firstborn child to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com or you can send us a tweet at genesisweek. Or you can go to genesisweek.com, which takes you to our YouTube channel. Find the most recent show and post a comment there. Or you can post a comment on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash genesisweektv. Remember those words of hope and warning from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org slash donations. And thank you for your support. Thank you.